Uh, it's a great uh, pleasure to have along tonight some uh, some some great observers from the BA. So we've got Owen Brazel, uh, David Strange, and Grant Privet. Uh, it's uh, talking on various deep sky subjects tonight, um, and uh, I think um, we'll just get started uh, with the first talk. Um, so Owen Brazel, I guess, will be known to almost everyone on the call if you've not heard of him. Um, well, um, <laughs> I can't really say much else about that, really. Um, but uh, yes, well-known character in, uh, in astronomy, a writer for Astronomy Now, president of the Web Deep Sky Society as well, uh, and editor of the uh, Deep Sky, the Web Society's Deep Sky Observer. So uh, uh, it's going to be talking to us on one of his favourite subjects, the uh, galaxy clusters, uh, uh, with a particular focus on things that we can view in the autumn months. So no doubt these will be a few of the things you'll be hunting down at Kelling Heath in uh, October. So uh, over to Owen now. Thanks, Callum. And I'll just say if the other presenters want to um, turn off their microphones. And... Okay, so um, most people, when they think of observing galaxy clusters, tend to think of the spring skies, where we have obviously the Virgo cluster, Coma cluster, and others. Um, but it turns out that there are actually a number of galaxy clusters associated with the autumn skies, and in fact associated in a very um, particular way. So um, what I want to do this evening, just very briefly, is to talk about what defines a galaxy cluster. Um, we'll, I'll not go through the, the contents of them, as most people hopefully on this call will, will know what kind of galaxies are and, and where they might fit. Um, so defining a galaxy cluster has typically been quite a, a grey area. Um, so as it says there on this side, they, they tend to have a certain number of properties and a certain um, mass size before they can be called um, a cluster. And one of the important things is the bottom point where when we look at the redshift of a galaxy cluster, it doesn't necessarily mean all the galaxies in that will have the same redshift. They can vary quite considerably because they have their own motions uh, within a cluster. And the important thing to note is what we actually see optically is only a small part of the mass fraction of a cluster, maybe only 1%. And perhaps surprisingly, the gas between the galaxies um, actually consists of a much higher percentage, maybe up to 9% of the mass fraction of a galaxy cluster will be in this hot gas. Now, unfortunately, um, this gas is so hot that it only really emits in the X-ray part of the spectrum. So it's a sort of a million degrees or so. Um, and it cools very slowly. It's very difficult to cool material um, at that temperature. And then potentially we have dark matter or something um, which consists of about 90 percent of the rest of the mass of a cluster. And when we think of a galaxy cluster, we tend to think of it in terms of a mixture of galaxies. As we can see here, there are mostly ellipticals. So these will be the yellowish galaxies from their um, older stars, um, the occasional spiral blue galaxies thrown in. And as we can see in this picture, there are also um, various gravitational arcs, which are galaxies a long way behind that have been focused by the, the gravitational attraction of the cluster itself. The other thing that we tend to look at with galaxy clusters is that they're not necessarily one blob. Um, they tend to be hierarchical and in many cases we see um, the clusters even in the current universe are still coming together. So um, the Virgo cluster, perhaps one of the you know the best known clusters in the in the sky, um, actually consists of four, probably four separate groups of clusters of galaxies which are still combining. So this is a, a young cluster that is hasn't quite got together. And because galaxies like to collect into clusters, it also seems that galaxy clusters then like to collect into superclusters. 
Um, and these can be very large objects indeed in terms of the universe um, and are probably the largest groupings that, that we're going to see. So the other thing I just wanted to clear up, um, and this has been a, a challenge, um, certainly in many magazines, etc., is what do we call clusters? So most of the clusters within the range of amateur telescopes come from um, either the original Abel catalogue or from the um, subset, or sorry, the superset, which was the Abel um, Corwin and Olewin version, which combined clusters that were seen in the Palomar Sky Survey with clusters that were seen in the southern skies from the two Schmidt surveys done at the UK Schmidt, as was, and the Isha Schmidt, which are both modelled on the 72-inch the at Mount Palomar, 48-inch Schmidt, I should say. Um, so nowadays, if you search for a cluster in a modern database, then you would use the shorthand of ACO, which stands for Abel, Corwin, Olewin, um, 426, say, um, and that would bring it up. Um, though you will find that a lot of older books and, and software um, in the amateur realm in particular still uses the original um, AGC um, definition. Now, this is problematic because in the professional world, um, AGC is used as a prefix for a Arecibo radio catalog. So um, we see people getting confused as to what exactly um, they're looking at. The other thing we want to look at is how we would classify a cluster, because this um, gives you an indication of, of what you're looking for um, on the sky. So the first attempt of at this was by Fritz Zwicky, um, and he came up with three types of clusters based on their um, visual interpretation on optical plates. So he'd come up with a, a regular or compact cluster, an intermediate or an open or irregular cluster. And in some ways, that is actually also uh, an age definition. Regular and compact tend to be older clusters, um, probably not work, uh, doing much at the moment in terms of merging. Intermediate are halfway between, and open and regular tend to be um, young clusters that are still coming together. However, as we got more information, we needed a better definition. And this came through to a couple of gentlemen called Rudin Sastry. Um, and they classified galaxies based on the, the dominant um, galaxy um, or how the cluster actually looked. So it came up with two of these and just a model along the, the Hubble idea. They came up with a, a tuning fork diagram as well to fit with their, um, their cluster definition. And here we would see um, B, for instance, would be a very um, would be the coma cluster, which has two dominant giant ellipticals. Um, CD would be Virgo A with M87, say, at the centre. And then the others form different sort of spread out versions, linear lines. Um, and we'll see an examples of those as we go later on. So the cluster I'm talking about this evening is the, or the clusters, are all part of a group known as the Perseus Pisces supercluster. Um, as it says there, it's one of the largest known um, structures in the universe and stretches across the sky more than 40 degrees. So this is quite a large um, area of sky that we're covering and also to search. Um, and it also um, fits in along with a, a void. And as we'll see in a minute, um, most galaxy clusters tend to lie on filaments surrounding voids. So um, as we can see there, it's at 40 degrees on the sky and it's well over 300 million light years long. Um, and this gives a, an indication of, of where we're lying. So I don't know if the, um, the, the cursor shows up on the screen, um, but you can see here that the Perseus Pisces chain sort of starts over in the, um, Pisces area with a couple of large galaxy groups rather than clusters and then moves through 
um, a couple of ABEL clusters, or well, three, to be precise, ABEL 262, 347, and 426. Um, and you can see even on this um, diagram showing um, the nearby universe galaxies, that it's not uniformly distributed. And you need to remember that it's not even 100 years since we discovered that galaxies were separate parts of the universe. I mean, Hubble's papers on distances to the nebulae came out at the end of uh, 1924, early 1925. Um, so, you know, in 100 years, we've actually gone a long way working on how these structures go together. So this is another look um, at the Perseus cluster. Um, I apologize if anybody's upset by the finger of God reference, um, but this is actually a time slice in redshift. Um, so it's showing um, how the galaxies are fitted together. So we've got the Perseus cluster over here. Um, we've got the Coma and, and Leo clusters over here. And, and they are actually bounded by areas where there is very few galaxies at all. So where do we go from here? So this is a map of the sky um, showing um, precisely where these clusters lie. So here we have um, Pisces 383, 507, um, and then we go to Abel 262. As I mentioned, this is an older software, so it tends to use the AEGC definition and across. And what we're going to do this evening, or briefly do this evening, um, is just look at some of these clusters as we go through them. So these are the four clusters I'm going to look at. The first three are all part of this Perseus, sort of Pisces, Perseus chain. And the last one, Abel 194, is not part of it, but is um, another very interesting cluster in the autumn skies. And probably the best guide to these is still um, the Web Society Deep Sky Handbook Volume 5, which was published in 1981 now, so what, over 40 years ago. Um, but there's really been nothing published since which covers galaxy clusters as seen um, with amateur sized telescopes. Now, it's worth noting that at the time this was published, they were doing um, using a 16 inch telescope, which was large for the time. Of course, now um, we have access uh, to very much larger telescopes and can see more of what's going on here. So let's start with Abel 426. Um, as it says, there, it's one of the largest of the local clusters with approximately a thousand galaxies associated with it. Um, it's been studied a lot, partly because the um, uh, brightest cluster galaxy or BCG NGC 1275 is a very interesting object in its own right. Um, but also it's near enough to us um, that we can study the details, not just of the, the larger galaxies, um, but also of some of the um, dwarf, almost down to Magellanic size galaxies themselves. So what does it look like? Well, this is um, the Abel 426. Um, and as you can see here, this would have been classified as a linear chain on the uh, classification of Rudin Sastry. Um, and you can see here the two um, bright galaxies, it's 1275, 1274, and it, it sort of forms a chain, but with multiple other galaxies around the area. Um, so this is what makes it an interesting target. Um, it's up in Perseus. It's not that far from Algol for um, variable star observers. Um, and it's one of these objects that I found uh, really needs to use medium to high power to bring the galaxies out. Um, my first really good observation of this was, in fact, from um, the old astro camp in the Ashdown Forest. And we were out observing it wasn't great. Well, that site was never great because it was always damp and humid. Um, but one night I was observing that area and there was a fine band of cloud that came through. And it was obviously the edge of a front because I remember after that passed through um, the number of galaxies I was able to pick up um, in that chain was was quite amazing. Um, and this was using 
uh, my old 20 inch that went then went to Callum and then from Callum went to Mark Stewart. Um, and it's one of these telescopes that seems to become my grandfather's axe. And I think the only thing that's original in it now is, is the main mirror. Um, but it, it did provide stunning views at medium to high power. If I use low power, um, the galaxy just didn't really stand out. The, the contrast wasn't there, even from a, a reasonably dark site. So um, this is a, a more detailed view of the main part of the cluster. And you can see there why NGC 1275 is of such interest. It looks like um, a Jackson Pollock idea of a galaxy with just a splat and things going out everywhere. Um, it's not actually clear um, what is going on there. Um, it's not clear whether we have a, a spiral galaxy in front of 1275 or whether there's actually a merger going on. What we do know is it has a very active black hole at the center and produces lots of uh, radio jets coming out, um, which impact the, the surrounds of the cluster itself. However, this is in order to give you some idea of what you might see or how many galaxies you could see um, in the cluster. Um, this is an eyepiece field map of the center of that cluster. Um, so this is using uh, a medium power eyepiece, um, and it, it's using one of my, my larger telescopes. But you can see here um, that you could count you know, maybe 15 galaxies or more in one field of view, uh, at least, and on a, from a really good site, probably many more. Um, it, it's unfortunate that we never really get the, the, the dry transparent air that our American colleagues um, find with these, and thus it becomes problematic to compare observations with from here with, with observations from there. But just to give you an idea of what Hubble sees with um, 1275, you can see here um, that the center looks like there's a spiral involvement. It's obviously material shooting out everywhere in the cluster itself. So that's my first cluster. So we're here, we're really going from left to right along the chain. Um, and if you want to see, this is just the number of NGC galaxies in the center. And all of those really should be visible in a, a 12 inch. So um, obviously Herschel was using an 18.7 when he found it, but it was a speculum metal mirror, and it didn't have the reflectivity of modern coatings. Um, and this is a drawing um, of the cluster made by um, a gentleman in the Netherlands, um, allegedly using a C11. Um, I have my doubts about whether he actually saw most of that um, and other work that he's done tends to be questionable. Um, but it does give you a, an idea of what the cluster might look like to a visual observer um, in the UK, say, with a, a 40 centimetre scope. And a number of people have done projects on, on this, drawing these, these objects and seeing where they go. Um, the interesting thing about Abel 426 is that next to it on the sky, we have this void where there are very few galaxies. So... As I mentioned, galaxy clusters tend to lie on filaments, and those filaments arrive or uh, surround empty areas of space. There may be the odd galaxy in them, um, but they tend to be lost and lonely. So going to, across to our next um, galaxy cluster, Abel 347, um, this is going to be, again, far more of a challenge. Um, about the same distance away as we'd expect, um, the brightest cluster galaxy here is NGC 910, um, but this cluster is quite different from the Abel 426 in that most of the galaxies are spiral. Um, now, this has two consequences. One is that it actually makes them more difficult to see. Um, spiral galaxies tend to have very tight cores, and of course, if they're face on, then they've got very low surface brightness. Um, uh, but it's actually also a relatively small group of galaxies or cluster of galaxies. So it's not anywhere near as rich as 426. 
The interesting thing about this cluster is that it's very close to the well-known galaxy here, NGC 891. Uh, NGC 891 is not part of the group, um, but over in the here, you can see um, some of these faint galaxies. Now, this actually makes it quite a challenge um, when observing. So when I was observing this um, from Calling Heath, um, and hopefully we might even get a chance of that in two weeks time again, um, I found it quite difficult um, to find many of the galaxies here and even more importantly to identify them because the, the cluster is small enough that um, if even if you're using fairly accurate digital circles, um, it only points you roughly in the area um, and you can find the galaxies, but you're not sure which one you're looking at. And again, um, this cluster has usually been a disappointment, but again, on a, on a very transparent night from Kelling, they, most of these galaxies did stand out. Um, this was using a what, 55 centimeter telescope. So it is probably the most difficult one here. Um, this is the, the center view of the cluster. You can see here um, that many of these are face on or close to face on spirals, um, which is why it's it's so challenging to find. Um, but also the cluster, although there's a center, uh, many of the galaxies are spread around. So it makes it again more challenging. Um, and you can tell that from that there are NGC galaxies here, but you can see many more of these galaxies have different names which suggest they're very much fainter um, and they weren't picked up by the the generation of visual observers that created the ngc itself the last of the chain of a, the abel ones is abel 262 now this is a slightly bigger cluster um, maybe 200 members and the again it's got mostly spiral galaxies. Um, the brightest cluster galaxy here is NGC 708. So the reason I put this in is so that, you know, if you want, if your software doesn't have Abel um, clusters in. So for example, a lot of people are very popularly using a program called Sky Safari on their phones and tablets to drive their telescopes. Um, Sky Safari has no concept of uh, or no object class of galaxy clusters. So although it has two of the Abel clusters in, none of the ones we're talking about here um, would be in it. So you'd have to go to the, um, the galaxy NGC number rather than the, um, the, the Abel name. So here it's mostly spirals. And it's also known as the FAF cluster, and nobody's quite sure why. <laughs> um, this isn't the typical thing name given to it by an imager because they thought of something. Um, this has been around for a long time, um, but I said no, nobody's quite sure why it's called that. Um, and this is an image of the um, cluster, um, and the brightest cluster galaxy is here in the middle. Um, but it's also in this strange Y asterism. And this is what you tend to go for initially when you're looking for this cluster. So here is a, a narrower field view. Um, and it's, it's actually quite an attractive um, grouping. It, it's not that hard to see. Um, again, when you're looking at these uh, medium to high power. So one thing I want to stress is that you know, the days of people saying that deep sky observing is done by crude light buckets and low power it is completely wrong when you're trying to look at, at galaxy clusters. Um, and there's a more detailed view of the, the Y asterism at the center of the cluster. Um, but just to give you an idea, again, this is the same field of view um, as the others. And you can see here that this center part fits in to the field of view, the, the white circles, the field of view is the eyepiece, the, the green circles, the supposed to be the, the size of the cluster. Um, but again, there are many more galaxies in that field. So once you've found where you are and, and looked at those, then it's worth searching around to find others. Um, so just very briefly, um, the NGC 507 group um, it, it's not and hasn't happened enough galaxies to be a cluster, um, but still is a fine target to go for. 
um, in terms of the number of galaxies um, in the group itself. Um, and lastly, we have the NGC 383 group, also known as the Pisces Cloud. Um, and this is a, a particularly spectacular chain of galaxies, um, as you can see from top to bottom. And more interestingly, in the center here, um, where we have um, a very close pair. Um, it's probably true to say that if you find the chain easy to find, um, then try looking for this chap off the, the side here. Um, he, he's a bit more challenging. Um, and then Abel 194, about 100 members. It's not far off the same distance as the others. Um, the brightest cluster galaxy here is NGC 545. Um, but as I said, it's located in Cetus, which means it's a bit low uh, for us. Um, and here, um, again, it's a linear group of galaxies. Again, we have this rather nice pairing at the top of the chain. Ignore the purple bit. It's not some UFO that happens to fit in the, the image. Um, and you can see here again um, that there are a lot of galaxies. Again, quite a few spirals, though the brighter ones here are obviously ellipticals or lenticulars. Um, and this fellow here, Minkowski's object, has always been thrown in as a challenge. So if you can find um, 545 and all the others, then whack the power up on this area and see if you can separate um, this rather strange object from NGC 541. Um, just to show you where we fit in, um, so the Virgo cluster's in here, um, and the Pisces superclusters over here. So it's the almost the opposite side of the sky from the um, Coma and Hercules clusters over here. Um, you can see there that the sort of massive chain. But it also gives you some idea that there are a lot of superclusters out there um, gathering together. So if this has made you interested in looking for these things, then there are a bunch of books um, slash computer programs that you can play with or mention the Web Society Deep Sky Handbook and the um, Observing Handbook and Catalogue of Deep Sky Objects, better known as LNS, um, also has observations and descriptions. Um, all these books contain information and some descriptions of these galaxy clusters. If you like pretty pictures, this is probably one of the best pretty picture books around. Um, all of the images in here when they were taken by amateurs. So if you look at them, that doesn't really show that way. And of course, if you're into observations, then we have um, the night sky guide, which has observations of all of these in there. Um, particular guide for ABL clusters is freely downloadable is Alvin Huey's one, um, which you get from faintfuzzies.com. Um, and then more information on some of these clusters and observations with different size telescopes um, can be found on, on this website. And if you want to look at the structure of how all this fits together in the, the universe, um, then this uh, is a particularly good website. Um, well, given I'm sort of out of time, I'll, I'll stop there and take any questions that you may have. Thank you, Owen. Thanks, Owen. So if anyone has any questions, then um, type them in the Q&A or on YouTube if you type them in the chat and I'll pick them up there. But yes, fascinating introduction to observing galaxy clusters. No? Oh, well. <laughs> Sometimes it takes a minute or two for people to type in the question. Oh, I've, I've got a question for, for, um, for Owen. Um, NGC 1275 has always yep. intrigued me. Um, and that, that beautiful Hubble image showing all the tendrils of H alpha, mm -hmm. can that be imaged by amateurs? The well, obviously, the galaxy can be imaged by amateurs. Um, I believe, yes, the answer is that um, a deep image of, of that will show up um, those tendrils. However, um, because they're hydrogen gas, you'd probably want to use uh, an H-alpha filter 
um, as well as the RGB luminance or whatever else you're using, um, and that will help pick it out. So I have seen amateur pictures showing that, but they they tend to use or amateur images show it, but they do tend to use the the H alpha filter as well to bring the filaments out. One to try for. We have have a comment, but not a question from Martin, which just says, "Brilliant, thank you." And I tried seeing the Pegasus cluster recently with no luck, but looking forward to trying some of these. Thanks. Um, well, it depends what size telescope you're using and what and what environment you're using it from, I think. Um, so as with any of these things, a dark sky is useful. And as I as I suggested, the, the, you really need to use a, a medium to high power. Uh, if you use a lower power, even with the same telescope and the same conditions, the galaxies don't show up that well. And so on those eyepiece views you had, though, and those were presuming something like 100 degree ethos eyepiece views, were they? Um, yes, um, <laughs> I sort of got it. I, I sort of like using the ethoses over the Naglas because I preferred the um, the colour rendition. So Nagler eyepieces tend to be a bit yellowish. Um, and a lot of my friends swore by the Pentax XWs, which gave a, a whiter image unfortunately the pentaxes didn't reach focus with any of my telescopes um so when the ethos first came out um i managed to i was work well as you know i was work, spent a long time working in the states and i picked up one there and i was just delighted by the the color rendition so i've tended to move to them um almost exclusively um but also the wide field means that on the the non-driven telescopes that I use, um, it just stays in the field slightly longer. I mean, they're obviously big, heavy, and of course, unbelievably expensive now. I mean, I couldn't afford them given their prices now, but when I bought them, they were somewhat cheaper. <laughs> I mean, observing from a dark sky, is there any kind of minimum aperture size you'd recommend? Or is it just you'll see more with the bigger the aperture? Um, so... I think for most of these, um, 12 inches probably going to be the minimum. And then the, the, obviously the bigger the aperture, the more you're going to see, or the more galaxies you're going to see. Um, so 12 inch will show the brightest galaxies in the 426 and probably in um, 262. Um, I think for 347, you're really going to need 40 to 45 centimeters to bring out much um, in that one. Um, but that's, of course, visual for imaging. You know, you can pick them up with a, a lot smaller than that. And we have a question from Jim Latham. He says, a great talk. Um, have you any views on the maximum power to use? Um, so the maximum power theoretically is 50 times per inch of aperture. Um, but Al Nagler suggested that, you know, very rarely will you ever be able to use more than 300 times um, because the seeing just isn't steady enough for that. I mean, on exceptional nights, um, you know, when it usually means that transparency is poor, but the seeing is <coughs> rock hard, you know, the time that you'd go off an image planetary uh, or planets, um, you can also use it on planetary nebulae. So, um, Andrew Robertson and I, with his large telescope, were up around seven or eight hundred times, um, but we've rarely managed to use that kind of power um, since then. And that's a driven scope. So on a small scope, even with an ethos eyepiece, you push up that kind of power and you're spending all your time just trying to bring it back into the field of view. And we have perhaps we said a final question from Dawson, which is, is a 14 inch SCC, I think he means comparable to a 14 inch reflector on these targets? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, obviously, um, the, the main issue with the 14 SCT is the large central obstruction, and that is going to um, reduce the contrast. However, nowadays, most of the um, Dobsonians and things out there are F5 or faster. 
so they're also going to have a very um you know a large central obstruction so it's not going to make a great deal of difference um really whether they're using the sct or not Great. Well, thanks very much, John. That was a fascinating talk and lots of great targets for uh, people to jump out and have a look at when we get to the next uh, new moon in, in October, which I think is just coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Um, so thanks very much, John. Uh, and uh, uh, if uh, anyone's got any further questions, if they just want to either get in touch with me or Owen directly, then uh, uh, I'll pass any questions on or uh, or whatever. Uh, and I'll uh, I'll just make a quick note of those items, uh, objects in the update, which I'll send around at the beginning of October as well. All right, um, so uh, on to our next uh, speaker for the evening. Um, very pleased to welcome along David Strange. Um, David Strange is down in, uh, in Devon, is chairman of the Norman Lockyer Observatory uh, down in Devon. Um, and uh, I, I, I asked David to talk this evening because I noticed on the uh, members' albums uh, he's been posting lots of great images of Barnard Dark Nebulae, uh, and I thought maybe he could give us a quick talk about the Barnard Dark Nebulae and his, his imaging uh, of them with uh, RedCat as, uh, as one of the instruments he's been using for that. Um, so over to you, David. All right, let me share my screen. Can you all see that? We can now, that's come through. That's great, yep, yeah, thanks. Great, okay, so my talk is about Barnard and his dark nebulae with a red cap. So the first part of the talk is gonna be about uh, Barnard, um, his life and his works. He was uh, regarded as the man who'd never slept. He was a most amazing man, dedicated astronomer. Um, what's even more surprising is about the circumstances in which he, uh, he entered into the astronomical field. So um, although a great uh, observational astronomer, he's also very much a pioneering astrophotographer. And you can see he passed away in uh, 1923, so this would be his centenary. First of all, I want to take you back. Um, Owen mentioned this, the state of astronomical knowledge, 126 years ago when uh, Barnard was making an impression. Everything in the universe was believed to be contained in the Milky Way. The nebulae or the fuzzy patches in the sky were believed to be structures our own, on our own galaxy. And uh, Lockyer, Norman Lockyer, believed the Andromeda Nebula was the region where a new sun was forming due to his meteoritic theory, which he'd recently produced. In other words, the universe was a much smaller place than it is today. Pluto was yet to be discovered, and the dark areas seen in the star clouds were believed to be holes in the heavens, as, uh, as Herschel described them. Some astronomical news. In 1897, uh, Lockyer had recently been, need, been knighted. He was director of the Solar Physics Observatory, and of course, he was editor of, of Nature. The popular science writer Agnes Clarke was offered a post at eight pounds a month as a human computer at the Royal Greenwich Observatory. But because it involved walking through uh, Greenwich Park at night, she declined. She actually visited us in spirit last night when her storm, uh, the storm Agnes, descended upon an island on the west coast of England. So we were okay here, but um, I think others didn't fare quite so well. Meanwhile, uh, on the other side of the pond, 40-year-old uh, astronomers making great discoveries in the night sky with an old fashioned six inch Willard portrait camera and his name was Edward Emerson Barnard. He is uh, born in Nashville, Tennessee, where he lived most of his life in uh, 1857. And his early life really was a struggle with adversity. His father died before he was born and his mother had uh, no means of support. He survived both the Civil War era, the Battle of Nashville, 
and the cholera epidemic that swept the city um, a few years later. He was given just two months of schooling and at age eight, he was sent off to work and he served as a photographic apprentice. Here's a young man uh, where he worked for the photographer J.H. Van Staveren, where he turned a set of wheels all day to keep a camera aimed at the sun to make photographic prints. Here he is a couple of years later, quite a steely-eyed young youth, uh, who, uh, and this was where he worked. This was amazing, I suppose today we'd call it a photographic enlarger. But in those days, they used the sun as a power source, and the device had to be kept pointed towards uh, the sun. The camera was called Jupiter, and it was situated on the roof of the studio. So um, he remained at the studio for 17 years, gaining knowledge of optics and photography. He even assembled a small spyglass out of spare parts. And by chance, he got hold of a book about astronomy and learned the names of the stars and the planets that he'd seen as a childhood. This was Thomas Dick's The Practical Astronomer, written in 1853. In 1876, he acquired a five-inch telescope for $400. That would have been a lot of money for him. But there were plenty of comets around. The great comet 1861 was Tebbett's comet. Shortly after that, in 1881, in May, he discovered his first comet. His second comet was discovered a few months later, September the 17th, comet 1881-V1. And he made a name for himself in Nashville by discovering nearly a, a dozen comets. Uh, Van Staveren sold the business to a chap called um, Henry Poole, who uh, went in mobile. There's his little uh, mobile van for outdoor photography. But the business was actually taken over by one of the employees, um, this guy Calvert. Um, there's the, the, the shop. Um, and it was Calvert's um, elder sister who uh, um, he married, Robert Calvert, in 1881. As an amateur, Barnard heard of a contest run in the 1880s by Hubert Harrington Warner, who offered a $200 prize per discovery of new comets. And Barnard had discovered eight in his time and used the money to build a house for himself and his wife and the residents of Nashville called it the Comet House. Here's a letter uh, written by Warner saying, I congratulate you most heartily on your uh, success, which is, I know, a result of extensive work and application, trusting your efforts may con continue successfully. Um, and this is the Comet House in 1882. I want to read uh, a little anecdote about this house in Barnard's own words. Times were hard in the last of the 70s and the first of the 80s, of course that's 1870, and money was scarce. It had taken all I could save to buy my small telescope. Then came the blessing of taking a partner for life and the renewed struggle to save something with the addition of a cheerful helper in the matter. I had been searching for comets for upwards of a year with no success, when a prize of $200 the discovery of each new comet was offered by the founder of the Warner Observatory through the urgency of Dr. Lewis Swift, its director. Soon after this, it befell that I found a new comet and was awarded this prize. Then came the question, what should we do with this money? After due deliberation, it was decided that we would try and get our home of our own with it. I'd always long for such a home where one could plant trees and watch them grow up and call them his own. So we bought a, a lot with part of the money, and this small lot was on what was after no, known as Belmont Avenue, but which was then not even a dirt road. It was hard to find the lot after it was bought, for it was out in the open commons. The place was in the midst of a scattering settlement 
of Negro shanties where the Negroes had squatted after the war. Though on beautiful rising ground, which I had selected in part because it gave me a clear horizon with my telescope. After some saving and some borrowing and mainly a mortgage on the lot, we built a little frame cottage where my mother, my wife and I went to live. Those were happy days, so the struggle for life was a hard one with working from early to late, the means for a bare existence and the hope of paying off the mortgage and sitting up all the rest of the 24 hours hunting for comets. We could, we could look forward only with dread to the meeting of the notes must come due. However, the hand of providence seemed to hover over our heads. But when the first note came due, a faint comet was discovered wandering along the outskirts of creation and the money went to meet the payments. And this continued after we'd gone to other scenes. The faithful comet, just like the goose that laid the golden egg, conveniently timed its appearance to coincide with the advent of those dreadful notes. And thus it finally came that this house was built entirely of comets. This fact goes to prove further the great error of those scientific men who figure that a comet is but a flimsy affair after all, infinitely more rare than the breath of the morning. For here was a strong, compact house, albeit a small one, built entirely out of them. True, it took several good-sized comets to do it, but it was done nevertheless. That's a rather lovely description of his comet house. So he was now getting a name for himself in Nashville, and a group of wealthy citizens raised money to send him to Vanderbilt University, uh, where he got a degree at age 30 when he studied astronomy. It gives me great pleasure to notify you of your election to a fellowship in this university uh, connected with astronomy. And in 1888, he was offered a post as assistant astronomer at the new Lick Observatory in California. This was a big 30 inch, uh, six inch refractor, which was then the largest telescope in the world. Of course, funded by um, Lick and built on the top of Mount Hamilton. James Lick was a master craftsman and piano maker. He made his money by selling a lot of pianos to uh, South America. Uh, he then went, invested in property and land in California just for the gold rush. And he made a fortune with his first great luxury hotel. And with his, with his money, he funded, he was the founder of the Lick Observatory. Big 36 inch refractor, completed in 1888, and was the largest telescope in the world. A lick is actually buried beneath the pier of the telescope. And it said that um, in his will, he funded, he, he asked that fresh set of flowers be placed on his grave every day. And I think that still continues. Um, here's a modern view of lick today. And of course, here is the great telescope. And good to see it's got an eyepiece in the end of it and not a camera. So while Barnard was here in 1883, he discovers or certainly writes about uh, the Giekenschein, the counterglow from anti-solar point. Sadly, we can't see it today with um, all our light pollution we've got to contend with. In September 1892, he discovers the fifth satellite of Jupiter, Almathea. He writes, Friday being my night with a 36 inch, after observing Mars and measuring the positions of his satellites, I began an examination of the region about Jupiter. At 12 o'clock, as near as may be to within a few minutes, I detected a tiny point of light closely following the planet. I immediately suspected it was an unknown satellite. However, Barnard didn't get on very well with the director of Lick at the time, a chap called E.S. Holden. Uh, but soon after he went to Lick, he picked up uh, an old portrait lens and mounted it on the big equatorial and took long exposure photographs. We we're talking about four or five hour uh, long exposures using the big equatorial to track the camera. Uh, I was making his wide field shots um, of the Milky Way. 
And you stand in the scientific world by the beauty of these photographs. Dr. A.A. A. Common, on presenting him with the RES gold medal, said, we must admire the skill and courage of the man who could, under the very shadow of the 36 inch refractor, demonstrate the merits of a lens bought for a few shillings. And this was the sort of work um, that he was turning out. Here's he, his famous snake nebula. Writing on the Milky Way, he says, the Milky Way has always been of the deepest interest to me. My attention was first especially attracted to its peculiar features during the period of my early comet seeking. Indeed, there's no work in observational astronomy that gives one so great an insight into the actual heavens as that of comet seeking. The searcher after a comet sees more of the beauties of the heavens than any other observer. His telescope, though small, usually has a comparatively wide field of view and is amply powerful to show him most of the interesting parts of the sky. To him, the Milky Way reveals all its wonderful structure, which is so magnificent in photographs made with the portrait lens. To me, the views of the galaxy were the most fascinating part of comet seeking and more than paid me for the many years of unsuccessful work. It was these views of the great structures in the Sagittarius region of the Milky Way that inspired me with a desire to photograph these extraordinary features. And one of the greatest pleasures of my life was when this was successfully done at the Lick Observatory in the summer of 1889. By now, Barnard's relationship with Holden had deteriorated and he really had the opportunity to use a large telescope. And in 1897, he was transferred to Yerkes Observatory in Chicago. And he had use of the new 40 inch refractor. So this was uh, four inches bigger than Lick. So they used to say, uh, we licked Lick with the telescope. And shortly after, uh, using a blink comparator, he discovers a swift moving star in Fucus, which christened Barnard's star, which turned out to be one of the nearest stars to the sun. He continues his study of the Milky Way clouds, which led to a discovery of the Dark Nebula. In 1919, he publishes a catalogue of 182 of these Dark Nebulae. And he writes, these dark nebulae are believed to be the result of molecular clouds of dust and gas, which are present in our line of sight and which have saw the starlight originating behind them, providing the Earth-based observer working the visible spectrum, the illusion of a black void. Whoops, not two. And of course we can see, uh, Great dark rift running up through Cygnus and Aquila down through to Sagittarius with a long exposure wide field photograph. The nice southern sky. This was actually taken from Branscombe Beach. There was a great uh, floodlight behind me, hence all the, the boats here were illuminated, but you've got the light pollution from Torquay here. But nevertheless, you can see some of Barnard's uh, dark nebula. In particular, this is the one you can see with the naked eye. This is his famous pipe nebula. There's a stem and there's the bowl of the pipe. You go to the next slide. Um, and there's the pipe nebula, Barnard 78. And there it is taken with a uh, little red cap. You only get, get the bowl of, of the, the pipe in the red cap. So, uh, Barnard's now working at Yerkes. Here he is with his 40-inch uh, refractor. And there's the fine Yerkes Observatory. In the biography to Barnard, a night of the great telescope was almost right. A sacred opportunity for a search for truth in celestial faces. Rarely has a priest gone into a temple with a deeper feeling of responsibility and of service than did this untiring astronomer go up into the great dome. Uh, and there he is in uh, Yerkes. And there's an aerial shot of this fine observatory. It was actually built by Charles T. Yerkes. He was an American financier. 
responsible for developing mass transport transit systems in Chicago and designing the London Underground. He was rather a ruthless man, not averse to bribery and blackmail, and he even spent a few months in jail due to fraud. In an effort to publish his badly tarnished image, he decided to bankroll the world's largest telescope. It had to be bigger than the Lick one, and he was lobbied by uh, George Early Hale to construct this observatory. Barn has a narrow escape. A few years uh, after he started working there, the floor of the, the, uh, the big 40 inch refractor collapsed. This was one of those the floors that could rise up and down to take the astronomy of the eyepiece. Um, and uh, he, had, he had left the observatory a few hours before. Uh, had he been there while it was, uh, had collapsed, he might well have been killed. Here's a link between our observatory, the NLO and McLean uh, and uh, Yerkes. Frank McLean and Jim Lockyer had just been to the Tonga eclipse a few uh, weeks before. On their way back, they stopped off at Lick and then Yerkes. This is June 22nd, 1911. Um, there's Frank McLean standing at the, the, the doorway with uh, Barnard and his wife. Just a few days later, they, both of them stopped off at Dayton, Ohio to meet up with the uh, Wright brothers. Um, and of course, Frank McLean was a clean aeronaut and he actually bought uh, 13 of his aircraft, but that was a, the art of flying just 112 years ago. So another reason that, uh, that uh, Frank McLean and, and Lockyer went to Yerkes, they want to have a look at the famous Bruce telescope. This was a telescope that uh, Barnard had used for his wide field plates um, of the Milky Way and his dark nebulae. It was made by the op uh, optical firm of John Brashear and it was funded by a New York heiress, Catherine Wolfe Bruce. And it consisted of three telescopes, a 10 inch, a six and a half inch and a three inch guiding refractor all mounted onto a single structure to form a powerful photographic survey instrument. And this was the telescope which Barnard used to make uh, photographs for his atlas. And the Mond Equator at NLO was actually modeled on the Bruce telescope. This was funded by Sir Norman Locker's great friend, Sir Robert Mond. He was a chemist, the founder of ICI, and you noticed it's it's cranked over. Now the idea of this was that a lot of these exposures on the slow photographic plate would need exposures of four or five hours. So on a German equatorial, when you cross the meridian, the telescope would dip down under and for fear it's snagging on the, uh, the, uh, the mounting, it was cranked over so you could do a long exposure. Uh, was put to good use at the NLO by Jim Lockyer. Here he is uh, standing at the, on the steps. We've still got those steps in the Mondo um, at the NLO. Now these are all Zeiss lenses and they were all designed as aero reconnaissance cameras in World War I, but they were put to grand use um, for wide field astrophotography at the NLO. Uh, after Barnard's death, um, he, uh, the photographic atlas was actually produced by Edwin Frost, his boss, and Mary Calvert, um, his niece. Um, and I'm happy to say they're actually, you can now access them online. It's called the Photographic Atlas of Selected Regions of the Milky Way and available at this um, web address. Despite falling health, uh, he continues observing. After a brief illness, he died uh, in February 1923, aged 66 years. And his story basically shows how skill, good fortune, and hard work, and a deep love of what you can do can take you much further than you imagined. He was probably the most prolific discoverer of celestial objects ever. Um, 
So we have a uh, Barnard's galaxy, we've got a Barnard star, 13 comets, um, a great, uh, great discoverer of objects. So the second time I taught, I'm probably going over time, uh, is objects imaged with this little red cat 51, little 51 millimeter aperture scope, um, which I have mounted on my RC10 here and it'll run off uh, roof observatory. Typical field of view, you can get the Andromeda galaxy in very conveniently with it. Um, and it comes with a little bucket of uh, mass, so you get nice uh, star sharp uh, um, images. And here is Barnard's 92 and 93 taken with this little telescope. Um, it was nicknamed the black hole. It's a lovely dark uh, nebula, shows up well against the star clouds of M24. And this would have been taken with an L enhanced filter on the red cat. The L enhanced enhances the H alpha part um, of the sky. The famous Barnard's E, um, although it's a letter E in the sky, probably visible in binoculars, it's actually two objects, uh, Barnard 142 and 143, probably about half a degree in size, about 2000 light years distance. Some of these are very photogenic. This is the famous Seahorse Nebula, Barnard 150, covers about one degree in the sky, about 1200 light years distance. And there are actually three uh, dark dust cores which are star forming regions, which were catalogued by Beverly Linz uh, as LDN 1082A, B and C. She published her dark nebula catalog in 1962, based on a survey of the red and blue plates of the Panama Sky Survey, which in fact include all the Barnard objects. The famous state nebula, the Barnard 72 and a Fucus, this lies just northwest of the Pike Nebula. Quite a large one, uh, Barnard 22, and the little flame. This is a little uh, emission nebula. This is part of the Taurus uh, molecular cloud. And that little flame is called um, Index Catalog 2087. B168 is rather a faint uh, dark tail extends westward from the famous Cocoon Nebula. Probably very hard to see that um, visually. North American Nebula. Um, this surprises me that Barnard didn't uh, take on board this as a dark nebula. In 1959, Stuart Sharpless realized that North, ne North American Nebula is part of the same interstellar cloud as the Pelican Nebula here, separated by a dark band of dust, and he listed the two nebulae together in his second list, uh, Sharpless 117. But American astronomer Beverly Linz uh, catalogued the dark dust here as L935. Now, in uh, Barnard's catalog, he only picks up uh, four dark objects here, B358, 355, and two objects at the top of North American Nebula. Um, and these are quite faint, small objects. <coughs> and two at the top, B352, <coughs> quite a large one, and B353. Of course, you, you remember, you observe North American Nebula called the um, H2 emission rather than his uh, dark nebula. Barnard 132 is quite a profound, large arrow shaped north pointing object in Aquila uh, near the border of, of Scutum. Um, Barnard 86 is described as a drop of ink on a luminous sky. A lot of these objects show up better are on the, uh, the, the these dark clouds. Um, and this is associated <coughs> with the star cluster NGC 6520, and again in Sagittarius. 
103, uh, quite a small one, just two degrees west of M11. And the Fishhook Nebula in Scutum, very profound tick shape, looking like a fish hook, which is a small bot globule. And the bot globules were catalogued in 1948 by Bart Bock and Edith Riley, um, which had drew attention to these small, round, dense, dark nebula about five to ten arc minutes across, which they believed was the evolutionary stage of pre-star formations. Barnard 112, not a particularly distinct one, but can be seen below uh, the lovely cluster um, M11, the wild duck cluster. Barnard 133, a very striking nebula in Aquila, again set against uh, uh, a myriad of stars. Uh, this is Barnard 169, 70 and 171, which lies in the Orion arm of our galaxy. It forms this arc around an island of stars. And finally, the Horsehead Nebula, Barnard 33, diffuse emission nebula, uh, the illuminations provided by the background glow of IC434. And if you remove the stars using a little program called Starnet, uh, I think that enhances the view of uh, the dark nebula. So, in, uh, to sum up, Barnard was a really gifted astronomer. He has a star, a galaxy, a moon crater, a Mars crater, 15 comets, an asteroid, and Barnard's loop all named after him. He, he remains in memory as a prime example of a self-taught amateur who became one of the internationally known pioneer astronomers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, David. That was uh, a great uh, overview of, uh, of Barnard's life in, 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 in 20 minutes, which is quite a remarkable thing to do, really. Um, thanks very much for that. That was, that was, that was very good. Um, if there's a couple of quick questions, uh, maybe you could put them on the Q&A uh, and uh, we'll, we'll take those. Um, so just a quick comment for David. Um, there's a book just being published called Barnard Objects Then and Now um, by Springer, which is actually an excellent guide. And they've tried to use a lens of the similar field to the, um, the Willard lens. So it's worth getting worth getting your hands on that. OK, thanks for that tip. I'm sure Callum's probably got it to review from Astronomy Now or the BAA or something. Not yet. <laughs> now, we have a question in from Nick Hewitt, which is, thanks, David. Is your camera and filter the same for each image? Sorry, is that camera and filter? The same for each image. Of those Barnard objects, yes, yes. What, what camera was it that you were using there? David? I'm using a ZWO ASI 533MC of the color camera. And I use it with either an L Enhance or an L Pro filter. Okay, well, great. Thanks very much, David. If anyone's got any other questions for David, you just pop them in the chat and I'm sure we'll get to them at the end. Oh, there's another one appeared. No, it was just impressive. That was all. All right. Next. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, if anyone's got any further questions for David, that, maybe just pop them in the Q&A and we'll, we'll, we'll catch up with them at the very end of, of the evening if, uh, if David's able to hang around till then. Um, anyway, um, moving on to our next speaker for the evening. Um, very pleased to uh, see uh, Grant Privet. Um, uh, Grant's been a, an, an imager for, for many, many years with the, the BA and also been keen to image challenging targets. Uh, and uh, a while back, he was uh, having uh, a lot of uh, uh, work on uh, local group galaxies and, and imaging some of the fainter ones of, of those. Um, so I thought it would be interesting just to um, update everyone that might not have heard of uh, 
um, that sort of project uh, and um, maybe encourage a few other people to go out and have a look at the, the local group galaxies. So over to you, Grant. Right, okay, just share the screen. Yep. Yeah. Right on. Uh, can you see what is the local group? Oh, that looks hopeful. Right, okay. Yes, it's, it's um, PowerPoint mode at the moment. Yeah, I'm just trying to, hmm, that should have enlarged it. Oh, well, let's try again. Hey, we have the technology. We have an idiot driving it, but we have the technology. <laughs> right, okay. Um, the local group, this is a, a new talk. I've never done this before, and I have no idea if my voice is going to hold since I have a, a throat problem, which means I can turn into Donald Duck. Uh, which is entertaining to everyone else, of course. Um, but for me, it means you end up having to have the rest of the presentation as charades or something. So, yeah, it's, it's awkward. Anyway, we'll, we'll give it a go and see what happens. Local group. Um, I've put this a slightly different level to uh, Owen, who did it. I really enjoyed his talk. I'm going to take, take Kimji's or some of those. But uh, it's a slightly different level to him. Um, so I, I'm assuming some of the people watching this don't, aren't necessarily aware of what the local group is and could do with some context. Yeah, some background. So we'll, we'll, we'll come at it from a lower level. So the local group, um, it's those galaxies that are gravitationally bound up um, with our galaxy and the group of galaxies that is a member of. So um, yeah, we're, we've, we're a galaxy and we've got a galaxy in Milky Way. Uh, that's got some satellites, there's some neighbouring galaxies, uh, and those are all bound up together because of their, their, uh, their gravity. Um, it's sort of like a globular cluster, but much more sparse, you know, sort of the things are sort of orbiting the Barry centre. Um, and the fun and games, of course, it's going to get messy. Uh, these are galaxies, these aren't stars, you're going to get collisions, you're going to get a bit of a mess. It's going to be entertaining, yeah, 10 billion years time, things are going to get really lively, but we won't be here to worry about it. Um, so that everything in the open in the local group orbits the Barry Center. Um, and some of these galaxies are actually quite remote. And the membership, we are, which galaxies that we can see are actually members of the local group. It's varied over the years. You know, things I thought of as local group members when I started astronomy aren't necessarily anymore. And things I've never even heard of have been discovered since. Um, so it's, this is very difficult work for astronomers because, yeah, they might be able to work out the distance reasonably well, but how fast they're moving sideways, side to side, that's a bit tougher. Uh, and yeah, telescope time is expensive and you have to fight for it. Um, so, yeah, it's not necessarily as well defined as you expect. And some things will come and go from the group as the observations get more and more refined by the professionals. So anyway, um, it's a bit of a chaotic mess for the local group. It's, it's, when it comes down to it, it's about 40 or 50 members. There's two discrete big lumps of galaxies. Um, and so it's not that bad in the end. As I mentioned, the group is dominated by, well, it's the, the Milky Way is one, and the Andromeda Galaxy. And, and they're both pretty big. Uh, they're, they're both decent sized galaxies. You're talking about 150,000 light years wide for Andromeda, about 90 something for us. Uh, which is pretty impressive. You're talking several hundred billion stars um, in each, uh, and they're, they're impressive. Yeah, and of course, on top of all the stars, which you can see the easy bit, you've got the dust, which is a bit harder to detect. You have to use infrared and radio waves and stuff, and you've got gas similarly. And of course, on top of that, you've got all the dark matter, which no one knows what the hell it is, but it's there, and it's certainly making the galaxies rotate in ways that mean it does have to be there. That has to be there unless gravity is seriously on the blink. And we're not understanding what's going on, uh, which is always possible in science. But well, if it happens and everyone realizes it's a mistake, they'll work out what's really going on, which is what makes science interesting. Anyway, so you've got billions of stars in, in each galaxy, and some of these galaxies have their own satellite galaxies. There's exceptions. M33 doesn't uh, have one. At least I don't think it does. Owen may know better. Uh, I'll have to ask him if you could ask that, ask that question at the end, whether M33 has satellite galaxies. I've not heard of one, but I might be out of date. I'm not as well read. Um, anyway, this is, uh, if you go onto Wiki, I, I nicked this from Wiki, but they say you can use it, so that's fine. This is a map of the local, yeah, 100, uh, sorry, 16 mega light years, yeah, next door, basically, in the, in the universe. Um, and you've got a clump at the middle, which is... Um, our galaxy and the bits around it. You've got a clump slightly to the left and up of it, which is the Andromeda galaxy and things associated with that. And off to the left, you've got a, a, a small grouping of other, a couple of other decent sized galaxies. And right underneath 
right at the bottom, you've got a galaxy in Antlia, a southern hemisphere uh, constellation, which I must admit I'd never observed. Anyway, so if we zoom in a bit, so you can see what's going on, which sort of helps. Milky Way, yeah, we've got Milky Way, we've got the um, Magellanic Clouds, we've got a bunch of galaxies you've heard of, you've probably heard of Leo 1, um, things like that. Um, there's, there's, you know, it's reasonably quite crowded. Some, yeah, there's quite a few there, uh, but there's a lot of smaller ones which aren't shown on that map. A lot of smaller ones. Uh, so that's where it gets really interesting when you do it going after local group galaxies. And if you nip over to Andromeda, there, so it's very similar. You've got, it's great. If you, if you think about it, M31, honking great galaxy, beautiful sight in telescope, lovely. You can see it naked eye, looks good in binoculars. But when you look through a so even a small telescope, say a two inch telescope, the first one I ever owned, two inch, um, you looked through and you had three Messier objects in the same field of view. And that's, <laughs> oh, that's Christmas. That is really good. Um, that must admit, those are the first three galaxies I saw. And it took me ages to see my, my fourth one. It really did, because those were so easy to find and so bright. But anyway, yeah, so um, you get the, the big galaxy, a couple of satellites, some other small ones like uh, NGC 147, 185. And off to the side, as I mentioned, we got these two, which are both quite nice galaxies for imaging. They're really nice. Yeah, they have, NGC 55 is far too south, far south for us. Uh, Aust yeah, the Southern Hemisphere types must have a great time with them. They're both nice uh, galaxies. Some things you go to will say, oh, they're members of the local group. Others say, no, they're not. Um, and it's there sort of in the area where it's iffy to tell. And yeah, there's a good chance they're not. They're probably associated with another another association of galaxies nearby instead. But your your heard them is referred to as part of the local group. So what yeah, just just in case you're interested, um the local group, does it change? Yeah, not, not, not much happens seems to happen in, in a lot of deep sky. Uh, and the thing is the time scale here is long, it's way longer than our, our lifetimes. We're talking billions of years and Billions of years times it billions of years time it turns into dodgems. It gets real fun out there. Um, the galaxies will collide, they will merge, they will strip each other apart. Um, it does get messy. Very few of the spiral galaxies will survive. You will end up with something like M87, which is yeah, a honking great elliptical galaxy. It's called a cannibal for a good reason. It's eaten other galaxies, and it probably will eat more in the distant future. Um so um that that is the fate of our galaxy that to be you know collide with uh, Andromeda uh, and form another galaxy. Um, so it, it'll be all changed in ten billion years time. I should say that picture is by Nick Samak. It's it's on the web on the BAA website. It's really rather nice. Ellipticals are really difficult to image and make look look interesting and attractive. And he's, he's done that one very nicely. Uh, oh, in, in, in case we ran ran out. Sorry, in case I got this wrong, my voice went wobbly. Um, there's a, a video we could look at, but we probably haven't got time. I think we're really going a bit behind now as it is, and I don't want to keep everyone away from what might be a clear sky for them. Anyway, the local group, what's it got in it? Um, a bit of everything, which is great. Um, there's something for everyone's taste. You know, as lots of people like to see spiral galaxies. It's got M33, which is a classic. It's inclined to us at 54 degrees. Uh, it's quite big. Yeah, it, it's, it's reasonably good size. Um, uh, and that, that's just sitting there in a, in a triangular and fairly easy to find as well. Um, we've got the Bard Spiral uh, M31 um, uh, Andromeda Galaxy. We've got the Milky Way, which is also a Bard Spiral that you don't tend to notice because we're in it. Um, and then you've got M32, which is an elliptical. It's a compact elliptical, but it is, it is an elliptical. Um, and you've got the irregular galaxies. Yeah, three, yeah, three obvious ones of those. But there's more than that. Um, and dwarf ellipticals. Um, and dwarf horizons. The only thing really missing there um, is a sort of fairly recent class of galaxies, which is the ultra compact dwarfs, uh, which tend to, I think they're thought of as trips nuclei of old galaxies or small galaxies, something like that. They've got a lot of mass for their, their, their size anyway. And Virgo's got loads of those. We, haven't, we don't seem to have any. I wonder if perhaps we do and no one's actually noticed yet, uh, which would be interesting. So there's, there's galaxies for every taste there. If you like galaxies, there's something in the local group for you. Um, and who can observe? Well, um, I've got to say, when I first started, I started with a small aperture telescope, or went from 31 thought, yeah, this is great, got it, no problem. Picked out M110 and M32, thought, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm getting out of this. I know what galaxies look like. Then I went looking for the next. Um, <laughs> it was some years later, 
Uh, I didn't have you on help to hint or tell me what was going on, really. Uh, M33 was the one I went for, and it was tough because I was living in London, which didn't help. You know, 20 streetlights within 100 yards, I think it was where I lived. Um, uh, and it was just so diffuse, I didn't didn't see it. I didn't realise what I was looking for. I thought I was looking for a nucleus with some stuff around it. And really, I was just looking for anything there that was slightly above background, and I didn't realise. So anyway, um, it would depend where you live, what you can see, obviously. But most of these will work, work much better at, at dark locations. Yeah, so if you can, pick up a telescope, put it on a tripod, bang it in a car, something, take it somewhere, try and observe from somewhere dark if you can. But as long as you can get somewhere dark, even if you forget the telescope, if you just took a pair of binoculars, you'll still see the Milky Way. And that is that is really worth it. It's worth going out to the Milky Way sometimes. Um, and binoculars, yeah, you've got lots of browsing down the Milky Way, lots to see in it, which is nice. Alternatively, yeah, if the weather's always rubbish for you or the light pollution is just so hideous you, and you can't you can't travel. Um, remote observing, why not? Yeah, get book telescope time, do it. It's, it's worth doing. Um, and we are lucky. Um, we get some of the best stuff. M31 uh, is high in our uh, sky, uh, which is nice. Yeah, all, all the stuff associated with M31, M33, all those, they're all high in our sky, which is really nice for us. So really, yeah, if you've got binoculars, naked eye, telescope, whatever, how you're doing it, pretty much anyone can have some fun here. And we're, by chance, a <laughs> good timing, Gallum, um, this is a good time of year, a very good time of year. If you look at the constellations involved, there's lots of it around at the moment. Um, the local group is very easy to see at the moment. In the spring, yeah, which is early morning this time of year, uh, you might start picking up, um, well, well, in the in the winter, sorry, uh, you might start picking up things like Leo as well, but the, the autumn will keep you busy. There is lots of stuff in Andromeda. And the Southern Hemisphere, they, they have lots of good stuff. I don't know what time of year those are, to be honest, uh, those constellations. I have no feel for that at all. Uh, but the, there's lots down there as well. And they've got the Magellanic Cloud, so they, they, they can't complain, to be honest. And they've got the Galactic Core. Cool. So Southern Hemisphere observers have a really good time with it, it has to be said. And I should say that that list was only partial. That's, as, that's what I could do in about 20 minutes of work. So yeah, that seemed a worthwhile return. Anyway, um, observing these things, yeah. Callum is the master, not Callum, uh, Owen is the master. Callum's close behind, I would have thought. Um, like visual observing, I don't do it much anymore, to be perfectly honest. Uh, my eyesight's not brilliant. My corneas must be going yellow. Um, I'm getting a bit of a firm uh, cataract, very slight. So, yeah, uh, observing visually isn't my thing. But from what I remember of the old days, um, I always like to make sure the telescope is clean. Yeah, it's as well aligned, well set up as I possibly can, or why did I buy the thing? Yeah, if I'm just going to leave it in the uh, to get scuzzy and have spiders nested. I had an earwig nest in one of mine once. Hey, you know, so I can't, I can't complain. But yeah, try and keep things clean. Um, go for the darkest nights. For this sort of target, the darkest nights are what pay you back the best. Um, I tend to find that after one o'clock in the morning works best, to be perfectly honest. Um, I did some plots of sky background versus time when I was taking pictures of a target. Um, and I tended to find that, yes, it would keep going down till midnight. Sometimes it get done going. And I thought, well, what's going on here? And I realised it's people turning lights off. Uh, it's people going to bed. It's less, less cars. Um, it's a number of things. So after midnight did seem to be better. All right, possibly only one o'clock was necessary, but I did get better results then. Um, the, sky is, the sky is darker. Um, and getting dark adapted, take it seriously. You know, that is the most important single thing you can do. All right, you, you, you can't buy atropine at the chemist to make your eyes dilate but you can just avoid light. Um, and that is really worth doing. Don't, don't use your phone. Yeah, don't try and use a computer. Just browse around stuff you can find by eye. Uh, it's really worth it. It, it. it repays the effort. And of course, as you get older, the time to recover from light exposure gets longer and longer. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's, yeah, it's a valuable thing. Protect it as much as you can. And things like keep, keep your eyepieces warm. Yeah, it sounds dull. Why do you want a warm eyepiece? Well, it's because if you accidentally breathe on it, it's got some heat inside it that will help evaporate any condensation you caused. Um, so you've got some hope of that driving off and you could, you've been able to use that eyepiece again in a hurry. Because I've done it. I've been happy observing, breathed out through my nose. I've got a moustache. It's gone into the eyepiece. Wham. I can't see a thing. Anyway, um, and I, I, one thing I would do is I, don't, I didn't tend to draw stuff until I'd been observing for at least half an hour. 
I'd sit there, I'd observe, I'd try and work out what was going on. I might, yeah, look around the scene, see what's going on around. But um, I tend not to draw stuff until I'm absolutely confident it's there. Um, and just, just looking, you tend to find more as time goes by. Yeah, and you see little patterns of stars and you see, you see more, and you do see slightly more stars, of course, because you notice them and the tube moves slightly. But anyway, so yeah, be selective as well. Um, you're not going to have that many clear nights. Choose targets that are interesting for you and go with those. Anyway, and if you're an old, old twit like me, get a dose in the afternoon before if you possibly can. Similar sort of things apply to digital. Um, yeah, again, get a dose in the afternoon because tiredness equals you start taking 100 images and forget to press save. I've done it. Um, it's not great. And uh, yeah, one of the things I really worry about with uh, local group galaxies, particularly thank ones, is you do need good darks and flats. You really do, because when it comes to it, you'll be stacking, some for some of these dwarf objects, you'll be stacking loads of pictures. The signal you're actually wanting to measure may be smaller than 1% of the sky signal. It may be that small. And some software you can buy commercially does struggle handling backgrounds very well. And people tend to use recipes that other people use. And sometimes I can look at an image and think, mm, the background modeling wasn't good, was it? You can see the, the wobbling around in the background. Uh, and it's really quite obvious and unpleasant after a while. Uh, so yeah, try not to overcook your imagery. Do do your flats well. Um, watch out for extraneous light sources. And again, use the darkest, clearest nights. And I know it doesn't really apply so much to galaxies or the, the more distant ones, but get the focus right. Um, the, that I, yeah, I, I've done it myself. I've sat there. It's been the end of a long day. I've been at work, and I thought, oh, I know. Uh, I focus, focus, focus. Oh yeah, that'll do. No, get it to the stage where you say that's good, and then stop. Don't don't stop with the that will do. Stop with it. That's right, uh, because you're going to take these images. You're going to spend two or three hours imaging something. You might as well make sure the focus is right. Um, I've got pictures that I took hours on, and I regret the fact I didn't adjust the focus halfway through because it softened up and I should have I just didn't realize but anyway so what's the best things um Milky Way to be honest is lovely if you can find a dark place you know my son St David's in Wales or something or west coast of Wales or Heartland Point in Cornwall or Northumbria Orkney in Callum's case yeah it's donkey I was up there recently and the skies are really good um go somewhere dark just look at the Milky Way it's lovely all right you won't see that bit that bit is the Southern Hemisphere. You've got Alfred Beta Centauri above the horizon. You've got Crux in there somewhere next to the coal sack. You've got a Carina. A Carina. It's the Southern Hemisphere. It's a picture I had where it went vertically, so that's what I used. Um, and it's it's a really lovely thing to see. And if you see it from a dark location in the UK and you think that's good, try somewhere really dark. I remember getting out of a car uh, on a volcano in Hawaii I'd driven up to the top, take an hour and a half to get to the top of this volcano, parked the car, looked up and thought, oh, flipping it, cloud. And it wasn't. It was the Milky Way. I re it really was that bright. And I was taken totally by surprise. I think I said that's quite rude when I realised. But, yeah, I was taken by surprise. It's lovely. And you get this sort of detail. Uh, I should say that last picture was just taken from fixed tripod. It's just you know, a bunch of 10-second exposure stacked. Uh, this looks slightly more sophisticated. I think, actually, this was uh, a mosaic of four pictures. And it's a lovely piece of work. I do like that. And you've got the Point Nebula again. What more could you do? And the Row of Fugai Association. And there's a planet. You can play Spot the Planet if you wish. Uh, it is a, a lovely object. It's near the galactic core. Can you imagine what the galactic core would look like if all that dust was in the way? It'd be astonishing. Probably a cook us, but... Um, Southern Hemisphere, they're, they're really, really fortunate. They have, yeah, some, some astonishing observing sites. Um, they have some beautiful stuff to look at. Uh, and they've got the, the satellite galaxies of the Milky Way, which are lovely in their own right. Um, so that's, uh, what more can you say? They've got the, they've got the magnetic clouds, look at that. Uh, they're about 20 degrees across, they're pretty big. Um, they're, I can't remember how far away, I did write down how far away they are. This, this is professional, isn't it? I'll, I'll look at my crib sheet. No, I can't find it, I can't write. Who knows? Anyway. That the about I think it's about hundred thousand like no about one million light years away, um, and they're twenty degrees apart, and each of them has stacks of NGCs, and uh, they're a lovely target, well worth seeing. 
Uh, I mean, any galaxy that's got tarantula galaxy in uh, tra sorry, tarantula nebula inside it is it wins with me. Tarantula is a beautiful thing, absolutely astonishing to image. I had one go at it once for about 10 minutes. That was all the time I had, and that was worth it. Uh, so yeah, the, they've got uh, the imaginary clouds, and those are great. And uh, both of those are well worth it. If you ever get a chance to go south, just yeah, just take it, do it, it's worth it. Uh, and of course, this M31, it's massive. It's bigger than all the others. Um, it used to be thought it was much more massive than ours, uh, Milky Way, but now less so. Uh, so the Barry Center might be halfway between the two groups, something like that, possibly slightly further towards M31. But it's got hundreds of billions of stars in it. Yeah, it's just astonishing. And it's got yeah, dark lanes, um, starburst areas. Yeah, yeah, you've got people observing globular clusters in it these days and occasional novae. Yeah, people search for novae in M31, that's how close it is. And it's fantastically detailed and it's big and it's difficult to miss. And yeah, that says it all really, it's just so much detail in there. Look at the number of H2 regions, it's just outrageous. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of globular clusters in there. Um, so, and the dark lanes aren't that difficult to image at all. They're really quite easy. I'm aware that uh, we're probably up to about time at this point, so I'll, I'll race through the next couple of slides, but that's, that there isn't that much more to do. M33, ne the next place I'd go, classic spiral, intraangulum, lots of detail again. Um, I mean, as I mentioned, no, no, no satellites, which is weird. Um, marginally visible to naked eyes, about, yeah, I thought it roughly equivalent to a seventh magnitude star. I saw it once when I was a lot, lot younger. Sure, I couldn't now. Uh, but I thought it was just about visible from the palm. And yeah, how you observe it, it's up to you. Yeah. Uh, for image on the right, uh, drawing on the left, it's quite a big telescope with one on the left. I think it was a uh, 0.5 meter Alan. Uh, is it Alan? Yeah, Alan used. Um, um, but there's a lot of detail. And he himself says, I think, in, in the uh, email associated with that, that there's so, so much detail, it's going to take him ages to draw properly. And that drawing the whole galaxy was a, a, going to be a real nightmare because it's just so big compared to its field of view. And there's so much detail, so much going on. So, yeah, how you observe it up to you. But these are really objects worth observing. They are very, very nice. And here's a few more. Um, these are, aren't as big. IC10 is really quite nice to, oh, I haven't labelled it. IC10 is really quite uh, nice, well worth a look. It's one bottom right. Um, Barnard's is a bit awkwardly placed. That's NGC 6822 at top left. It's in Sagittarius. So it's poorly placed. But NGC 185 and 147, really well placed tonight. Really well worth a look. Um, that would be a, a, a useful target. If you want to find out what it's going to be like to orbit the fainter stuff, try those. And if you're happy with those, then you can move on. Once you've got, you got to the stage where you can have good images of any of those four, uh, then yeah, you, you're set to go further. Um, and I should say those four are probably about as far as you can go visually, though, yeah, that's without using monster telescopes and being hugely experienced, I'd say. Because um, some of the other stuff is really quite hard. Um, the one at the top, I, I should say, the one at the top, um, that's Leo 1. Lots of people have imaged that. Um, it's it's not a huge galaxy. It resolves quite nicely. It resolves into stars really quite nicely. Um, the picture in the middle is the only remaining picture. I have of 70 gigabytes of data I lost at the weekend. Uh, <laughs> yes, I am a moron. Um, I lost 70 gig of data, including this, which is why it's got a poor background. It's just the first uh, image. And, uh, and in the middle one with the Ursa Minor Dwarf, there is a galaxy in there. Some of those stars are galaxy stars. But it's not obvious, is it? It really isn't. You've got to do very, very well with your background subtraction and such like to bring it out. Uh, and about limit for me at that point was a uh, the dwarf in Aquarius, which was uh, a bit easier, but that was only with a 10 inch. Um, it's an old IE 10. Um, and that was quite a good night. And all of those I only took on a dark, clear night. I didn't go anywhere near it if the moon was out or if there's a hint of a haze. It's just not worth it. You have to work for those. Those are harder targets, but there's a lot of them. I did uh, one of the ones I lost at the weekend was Andromeda 1. And that is, that is doable. Two, two hour exposure, 12 inch. Yeah, you get it. Um, it's there. You have to be careful with your sky background, but it is there. So you can that means you can image probably over half of the local group, I would have said. Well over half. And the thing with the local group, I said some objects come and go. Uh, here's examples. All these objects have been considered members in the past. They aren't now. 
uh, but they're still great galaxies. Uh, they're really lovely to image. Um, the NGC 1560 at the bottom, I've really got to have a go. I, I like the look of that. Um, so, yeah, there's all these galaxies out there. It's autumn. They're worth looking at. And finally, beyond that, there's other groupings. Yeah, there are things like yeah, IC342, which is a lovely face on spiral. It's quite dim. Um, but it's not that bad. I know it has been observed visually by lots of people, I think. Uh, but it does require a fairly big telescope, good dark adaption, good sight. Uh, you have to take it seriously. Um, and of course, after that, there's things like the Virgo cluster. And yeah, Virgo's just packed full of goodies. So yeah, this is really more of a rabble rouser of get out there and observe galaxies. They are really interesting. They don't respond to filters so well, which is a bit of, bit of a shame. But they're really worth observing. They're wonderful things. And anyway. Uh, local group has something for everyone. I think it's the bottom line from this. Uh, it's around at the moment. Um, some of it is absolutely beautiful and you can photograph it very easily or, Im or image it or um, draw it or whatever. Uh, I remember spending happy hours sitting there drawing M32, M31, M110. Uh, yeah, loads of hours doing that. And trying to make it better each time as the telescope's got bigger. So um everyone can have fun and are there any questions queries or anyone will have a row thank you grant that's fascinating um we do have a first question in which is from dawson which i think is probably james and he asks have any of your visual observers worn orange red goggles before observing to help with dark adaption um i don't know about if anyone else knows but i certainly tried wearing dark glass well sun sunglasses for about half an hour before going out a few years ago uh, i used to try it when i was still visually observing i did try it. i thought i thought it helped a bit i don't think certainly didn't think it did any harm uh, obviously it made me look very cool but um yeah, I, th I don't see it does any harm. I don't know why they have to be orange, though, particularly. Is that just to cut out the blue? I think people suggest that if it's sunny before observing, you should be wearing sunglasses most of the day just to stop your eyes getting bleached. Mm -hmm. um, people do report um, having um, success using red, red um, glasses because oh. um, it helps keep your eyes dark and obviously if you ever go back inside they're almost a requirement to stop losing yeah. your, your dark adaption but it has, as Grant said I've never heard of anybody talk about orange glasses um, the ones that builders use for seeing red lasers for measuring you can get from Amazon they're, and they're pretty cheap to have a play with hmm. that's good um no more questions for Grant at the moment, but we did have a couple of comments during earlier talks from Mike Folan on YouTube. Um, he says he recently acquired the Web Deep Sky Society Galaxy of the Month book, which he says is a fine book with plenty of information. He just wishes the weather was better. <laughs> Don't we all? And then he also says he could detect M33 with his eyes when he was a lot younger and there was a lot less light pollution. He said, considering the distance, he thought that was an amazing uh, feat to be able to do. I mean, I've certainly seen Leo one visually, um, but I've not gone after many of the others. I've seen M333, those little mini Constellation binoculars. Mm. That's cheating, David. <laughs> <laughs> I've got a I've got a question for Grant. Um, in our youth, dear old Patrick Moore told us there are hundred thousand million stars in the Milky Way. Young Brian Cox comes along twenty years later and doubles that number to two hundred thousand million. Who was right? <laughs> not patrick <laughs> who's got the better data <laughs> oh grant the L the magellanic clouds it's about one eighty thousand light years to the lmc and about two hundred thousand to the smc apologies i thought it was 100 okay right thank you very much 
It's not a million, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell is a million then? I think it's something written down. Oh, well, my mistake. Apologies. <laughs> That's almost that Andromeda, isn't it? A million light years. Uh, two million? 5, is it? Two million to Andromeda. Halfway to Andromeda. I, I guess the number of stars in our galaxy has been counted a lot more accurately by the professionals in the last 20 years or so. Yes. I, I was just trying to think. I'm sure I've heard bigger numbers recently. I might just see if I can find any um, reliable references. How are they justifying the bigger numbers? Well, Gaia's measured two billion. Oh, that's right. just on our side. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can at least double that. Yes, and and I think it's difficult to be accurate because there are a lot of very faint stars. The majority of stars are very faint, so the ones you tend to see are the brighter ones. And I, I, I wouldn't trust this sort of 100%, but just looking at Wikipedia, for example, they quote 100 to 400 billion. So I would think that sort of range sounds reasonable with the uncertainties of trying to count. And, and also how far out you go from the galactic centre. Mm. I was wondering how the banks would take to it if I went to them and said, well, my bank account is between, what, yeah, £10 and £40? What do you think? <laughs> I mean, the other way to do it, Andrew, would be to get the mass and then divide it by an average star, and that would give you a, an average rough number, wouldn't it? Yes, although the only, the only problem is with all the dark matter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, I, th I think these kind of figures are, 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 as time goes by, are getting better refinements to them with, with satellites like Gaia. Oh, we have a question. Simon Street asks, anyone tried Astro Hopper web app? Seems good to me, seems too good to be true for a simple push to with a mobile phone app. Sorry, what was that? Astro Hopper. No, I haven't heard of that one. I've he I've heard of it, but I've not tried it. It's, a, it's like a star hopping assistant. I've um, not used it either. App, yeah. So it only requires the phone. I guess the problem is, if you're looking for anything faint, then if you're looking at a mobile phone, even turning down the brightness and kind of doing other stuff, you've got that kind of light shining in your eyes. But if you're looking for something where you don't have too great a concern, then, or if you can note down the information beforehand when you're indoors. I think from what he's saying, it's some kind of uh, free app that you're supposed to point through your eyepiece or something. Yeah, it's a, it's a free app. So in other words, it'll be rubbish, but people can post on Facebook and pretend to be clever. <laughs> So it binds the phone to the tube, apparently. Yeah, I think uh, you attach it to your telescope and then then it will guide you through this, the hops, I think, ah. is how it's supposed to work. Got a question from Jim Latham. Roughly what sort of orbital periods do LG galaxies have around the Barry Centre? <laughs> but that's a tough one. <laughs> I think that's called Wikipedia. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be billions of years, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I can't remember how long it is until we collide with um, uh, Andromeda. Is it about three billion years or four it's billion years? Something, something of that order. About yeah. three and a half billion, I think, is currently. Yeah. Uh, apparently, Jim's tried um, Wikipedia already. <laughs> <laughs> Oh right, Chat GPT. <laughs> I was going to. I was next going to say that it could be the pro a similar problem with Chat GPT in that it can't come up with new information. <laughs> I 
I guess the Barry Centre is going to be about halfway between us and M31, isn't it? Well, if the mass is right, roughly equal, yeah. Like it used to be M31 was supposed to be a lot heavier, wasn't it? But that seems to well, be a, bit, a bit heavier, yeah. Yeah. And I suppose the satellite galaxies of each are roughly, well, they're all uh, roughly yeah, sensibly distributed. So, yeah. So negligible in most cases, aren't they? Oh, that's true, yeah. They're not well, very big. We've got an answer from Nick Hewitt, which is the Sagittarius dwarf orbits in hundreds of millions of years. But to billions, I think. So I'm not entirely sure whether he's saying the, the, that it's from hundreds of millions to billions. I guess is that's orbiting us, not orbiting the Barry Centre. Uh, not billions. Ah, oh, I've got it. So hundreds of millions. But yeah, that's a good point. So that's orbiting the Milky Way rather than orbiting the the Barry Centre of the local group. I think it's on a collision course, isn't it? Or it's already colliding and ripping bits out of it. Or is that the other one? There's two Sagittarius dwarfs, aren't there, Grant? There's Sag Dig and Sag Deg. Yeah, there's and I, I was aware of two, yeah. I don't know much about the second one, though. Is it is it Sag Dig that's being torn apart or Sag Deg? Um, I can't remember. Is that, is that, that's the one with just a couple of Palomar... Uh, yeah. Panama globulars, isn't it? Yeah, M fifty fours are supposed to. Yeah, that's it. Cool. Yeah, but that's that's the limit of my knowledge of it. I'm afraid, and not that it's anything which we can observe. But I know with um, Gaia, they've detected. I'm pretty sure, kind of the torn apart streams of previous galaxies, which have dwarf galaxies, which have been consumed by the Milky Way. Well, about six, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Right, well, I think we're just about, uh, well, just over our uh, allotted time for uh, for this evening's uh, talk. Oh, talks, another Q&A come up. The, the final one was a comment from Simon Street to say M31 globular clusters are great targets to find. And he's found a couple of the brighter ones. Yes, indeed they are. Yeah. Good, so I'll just... Uh, Finish up by uh, thanking uh, all of our speakers tonight, Owen Brazil, uh, David Strange, Grant Privet. Thanks very much for uh, all of your talks tonight. I hope it will inspire members to go out and have a look at some galaxies and dark nebulae through the uh, through the winter months. And uh, also really like to thank Andy for uh, uh, hosting the uh, the Zoom tech stuff tonight. Uh, it's always really appreciated when. And um, somebody who knows what they're doing is working all the tech stuff as opposed to me messing around with the buttons and not knowing what to press <laughs> when. Um, so uh, thanks very much for that, Andy. Uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, attended tonight, uh, uh, either on, on YouTube or on, on Zoom. We had, I think, at the peak about 18 people on YouTube and 37, 38 on, on Zoom. But I expect there'll be a few more watching afterwards uh, on the on the replays so uh, uh, thanks very much for for viewing if anyone's got any questions they can always drop me a line at the uh, uh, at the ba uh, deep sky at britastro.org uh, and i can pass those questions on to any of our speakers uh, if you don't have their direct email addresses um uh, thanks for coming on tonight and i uh, hope you get some good clear skies and good observing over the next coming months Thanks so much. Good night.